You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome to the Christ and Classics podcast. I'm your host, Colton Moore, and I'm flying solo today. And here on episode 17, we're dealing with Homer's Iliad, books 18 through 20, nearly all the way through it. We, we've, uh, we haven't been on the show for, I guess, three, four, four weeks now. We did so to take a break for uh, the holidays that, that came up. And then we had, uh, mainly Devin, had a, had a couple of rounds with family illnesses, and they're still down for the count. So... Us being just, or we being just Devin and I, trying to uh, record our conversations. Uh, this is what we're doing. Just me today. I think it's just going to be me today um, for this episode and next episode. And uh, we'll keep going. I After this episode, we're going to be recording with um, Michael Ward from the University of Oxford to discuss... Uh, C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, in particular, we're going to be using uh, Dr. Ward's book, uh, Planet Narnia, uh, to launch our discussion off. And what we're going to do after that is we'll take a break from Homer and dive into Lewis's uh, Seven Chronicles, and we'll take an we'll we'll take an entire book. For uh, uh, per episode, so we'll have seven episodes for the seven books of Lewis's Chronicles: the the Line of the Witch in the Wardrobe, uh, Prince Caspian, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the Silver Chair, the Horse and His Boy, uh, the Magician's Nephew, and the Last Battle. And we'll conclude that with our recording with uh, Doctor Ward. In fact. We're recording with them in the next five days, I think on Monday or like three or four days on, on Monday. And then we'll kickstart our uh, Narnia series, uh, conclude it with Dr. Wards. And then after that, we'll pick up with, uh, with, with Homer's Odyssey there. Okay. So um, it's going to be a little strange without Devin, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, I'm not used to recording just myself. Um, so this video... This uh, podcast episode may just be a little, maybe a little shorter, but hopefully, nonetheless, um, helpful. So, what we'll do, uh, what I'll do is, I'll simply just give us a summary, and then I'll uh, jump off with a, a question that I think is central to uh, what we've been um, exposed to in books eighteen through twenty. Now, now I'm. I'm fully aware that most listeners are not reading the Iliad side by side with us week to week as we're putting these um, uh, podcasts podcasts out. The goal and our target and and our target audience for the podcast is to serve educators, is to serve students of the classics. Like we hope that this podcast could be a sort of audio spark. Uh, audio Socratic spark notes, if you will, where we're, we're simply trying to refine our questions that we're bringing to these books. Um, David and I have been really influenced by uh, a short little um, speech that Jacob Klein uh, from St. John's uh, College gave back in the 70s called, um, what is it, uh, learning, learning by Means of Discussion? Oh gosh, uh, I wonder if I can pull it up here. Learning. Oh gosh, I can't find it. So, it, 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 in this little essay, Jacob, or this little speech, really, rather, Jacob Klein says that the goal of the Socratic seminar at St. John's uh, is to not. Um, D- download data into your mind. It's not to just input information, and it's not necessarily to answer all the questions that we raise. 
so much as it is to understand the the possibility of questions that are out there the possibility of options that we can choose from and then go from there it's a he says uh, the the seminar is to expand our horizons uh, our intellectual horizons if you will and so as you've seen sometimes we answer our questions sometimes we don't um, and sometimes our uh, our questions lead to better questions and I'm going to try to do that today for us. And so this section in Homer's Iliad, um, books 18 through 20, um, Patroclus has just died. Hector has just slaughtered him and has taken his armor, which means he's taken Achilles' armor. And by the time book 18 rolls around, uh, word has gotten back to Achilles that his brother-in-arms, his basically his companion for the for his entire life um has been slaughtered by by Hector and he weeps he cries he wails and Thetis his mother hears her son's cry and uh tries to console him but he's not satisfied um Thetis then knows that her son has to go to battle and fulfill his fate which is to die uh in the war and so she flies to Hephaestus the god of the blacksmith to make Achilles uh, some new armor because Patroclus had Achilles armor and Hector yanked that off of him uh, after he killed him um, and long story short long story short uh, Hephaestus makes this armor and by the time book 19 rolls around uh, Thetis presents this armor to him now, the armor itself is uh, uh, is a is an armor with with, consist, with with concentric circles with the earth, sun, and the moon and the stars in the center, and then the next concentric circle is a city at war and a city at uh, and a city at peace, um, and the next concentric circle is divided into three into three uh, sections: plowing, reaping, and the vintage. Vintage meaning like. Um, the time for the wine harvest, and then the next the next uh, concentric circle is divided uh, further into three with cattle, sheep, and then dance, and then right on the edge of it is this river, ocean, this mysterious outer realm, and so um, he gives this armor to him, and it's the the armor uh, of the gods, impenetrable by man. We'll come back to the we'll come back to this shield because I think. This is where my question centers. This is the question that I that I still have uh, regarding the uh, the Iliad, and I think I've, I've 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 come a little bit closer to to trying to answer it with my what is this my fourth fifth time through the Iliad. Okay, Achilles gets this armor, and then uh, Book Nineteen rolls around, uh, and Achilles and Agamemnon reconcile in a pretty beautiful in a pretty beautiful way. Um, Achilles repents of his anger, uh, a bit of his selfishness. Agamemnon, too, concedes to his errors. However, he kind of makes an excuse, which, from our perspective as the reader, it's a pretty valid excuse. Like He says, the gods are to blame for our strife. They're in uh, Book 19, Line 100 in, in Fagel's edition. He, he shifts the blame to, to the gods for their actions. Um, which it, that does just again raise the question for us: who who's responsible for humans' actions in this in this epic? The gods or the humans? It's that it's that tension, and in the Christian world, we call it divine God's sovereignty, um, and man's responsibility, at least in Protestant circles, and um. It's this paradox of we have free will as humans, like the the men in in, in this epic have free will, but yet the gods orchest are orchestrating everything in such a way that doesn't compromise human freedom. Okay, Achy the book nineteen ends with Achilles recognizing his doom, recognizing that the prophecy about him is about to come true. He's about to go back into war, and he's going to die very soon. And yet he goes 
anyway. And there's a there's a bit of um, at least in my heart, a bit of admiration for Achilles, knowing that this, knowing that he's about to go to his death, and uh, he he goes willingly. So that's that's admirable for me. And then book twenty rolls around. Uh, Achilles suits up for armor, and as he does so, Zeus um, talks with the gods above in, in, in Olympus, and uh, basically revokes his command earlier in the in the epic for them to interfere explicitly in the war. And so we see as as Achilles is suiting up for armor with his new um, divinely powered armor and shield, so the gods themselves are suiting up for armor, ready to fight once again with Hera and Poseidon and Athena on the side of the Greeks and Apollo and Ares and Apollo, Ares... I think that's all on the Trojan side, right? This is where I need Devon, at least Apollo and Ares. Anyways, the gods who are for the Trojans and the gods who are for the the Greeks, they're suiting up for battle to uh, infiltrate the war again to explicitly assist these humans. And so the the epic has now shifted to Achilles. We've we've had glimpses. Well, we've had we've had snapshots where um various figures various heroes in the epic have had their 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 moment of fame i think it began uh well well it it, it began a little bit with menelaus in paris and but then the the individual that stuck out was in book five i believe or five uh five or six with uh diomedes just slaughtering everybody um attacking the gods we have um we get a uh, a uh, a zoomed-in picture of Ajax the Great, Hector at times, then Agamemnon. Um, we don't see Odysseus um, as, as clear uh, because we'll, I, I think we'll see him in in in, in the sequel, with, with, which is the Odyssey. Um, and and now, uh, oh, and then we have uh, Patroclus in, in all his glory, and then right at the very end we have Achilles. Finally, he's come out of his out of his shell. And he's given a shield. And the shield uh, has been interpreted in a few different ways. But what's, uh, what's clear is that it represents the, the human cosmos with the earth, sun, moon, and the stars at the center. And then you have a, a city where human beings dwell specifically. And at times, it's peaceful. And at times... There's bloodshed and war and fighting. With every city and every civilization, you have food. So you have to plow the land, you've got to reap the land, and you've got uh, um, wine to drink and to celebrate. And with that also, you've got cattle and livestock and sheep, but then leisure and, and dancing. And I think the shield presents this wholesome, this wholesome view of humanity. And my question is, um, I guess there's a few of them, but the the big one is, why does this shield come to Achilles at this point in the story? What's important about this shield at this moment in in the epic? As we think about Achilles, and... Achilles, up until this point, Homer has portrayed as a pretty self-centered, um, kind of a sulky, um, quasi-whiny kind of figure, yet a figure who is uh, vicious and powerful, the greatest warrior in the Greek army, who's been wronged, rightfully so, but as the prologue, the proem, has made clear, Achilles has cost countless Achaeans their lives. And I'm wondering uh, why this shield right now, this, the, 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 why this picture, this explicit image of human civilization in all of its wholesomeness with Achilles. And so I'm thinking of Achilles coming out of his shell. He's repented of his rage 
to Agamemnon, and he's given this shield. And so I'm wondering, does Homer partially intend the shield to be a rebuke for the one who bears it? Or, I'm thinking on the fly, I'm, I'm thinking on the fly here as well, uh, or is, is Achilles somehow, or does the shield represent Achilles? Because at least I'm, I'm thinking of the city at peace and the city at war um, aspect of the shield, where you, you've got Achilles raging and raging and raging, and then all of a sudden there's this peace that comes about him with Agamemnon that they've reconciled that there's this paradox where peace and um bloodshed or pl- peace and, and anger can can reside in a single person this this complex um figure that we call a human can it is both capable of peace and hatred simultaneously well yes simultaneously but also like in in one breath we can hate a person, and then in the very next breath, we can repent of our rage, our hatred, and um, make make amends with him. Or is there something else going on? This is where, this is where having good friends uh, to discuss these matters with is really helpful. This is where. The intellectual horizon is expanded when another person, say like Devin, whom I'm missing right now, can come in and help me think through this question. I'm a bit of at a loss. I've, I've quite frankly, I've been at a loss a bit. Um, uh, the last, this is my what my fifth, fourth, fifth time through the the Iliad, and I've read um, Michael Wilcox commentary and a few other articles about the shield. And I'm still a little perplexed by it. It's a beautiful image of of the of, uh, of the human cosmos, um, but I'm wondering how, still <clears throat> how it relates to uh, Achilles at this point in the story. And right now, I'm thinking that this shield either represents Achilles as a man in all his complexity, with his uh, peace, with his hatred. Um. Or, as he bears it, it's rebuking him for disturbing the balance of human existence by holding on to his hatred and rage, bitterness for Agamemnon. I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, But he has it. And uh, it's a it's divinely empowered, and it's impenetrable. And also, I wonder if it represents Troy too, because um, the chief city of this e- uh, epic is is Troy, and right now Troy's at war. Troy is at war with the Greeks for stealing Helen. And the war impacts the peace of the city, the second concentric, the second concentric circle in the shield. It impacts all the resources of the city, uh, the grain that's been reaped, the wine that's been reaped, um, the livestock that's been raised for food and offerings. And it even impacts um, the outer sphere, that river ocean, this this divine um, transition from the earthly realm to the divine realm. The gods are now at play as well. And maybe one day Troy will be at peace. But if Zeus's prophecy comes true, there will be no more peace for Troy. Um, Achilles bears these these arms into battle, and as we move into book twenty one, Achilles will begin to use these arms. And if you can imagine a lion that's been cooped up in a small cage, angry, and he's let loose, 
then you can imagine what Achilles is about to do with these arms. Um, and so as I conclude, or try to stumble along to an ending here, um, I'm th- uh, my, my thoughts right now about the shield and Achilles are twofold. Um, well, I guess threefold. And maybe, maybe there are uh, intentional layers that Homer intended, uh, layers of meaning that Homer intended for the shield. I'm not entirely sure. Um, the first could be that uh, the shield itself represents Achilles, and or at least Achilles as he ought to be, as a little as a little city himself that is filled with peace. It's filled with war. It's filled with um, all the wholesome uh, energies of plowing and cattle raising and wine drinking and leisure all surrounded by the gods but it also could be a rebuke to Achilles uh, as he bears the arms he's bearing the ideal that he doesn't meet up to he's been he, he's given over he's given himself over to his hatred and um, it's just now at the, this point in the story where he begins to repent but maybe there's also an aspect of of Troy as well. Maybe the shield refers to Troy and all of its glory as a, as an ideal that it's not ever going to meet up to because it's about to be raised to the ground by the Greeks. Hmm. Not entirely sure, but uh, we got to wrap it up. So onward to episode eighteen, where we where I'll uh, I'll be I'll be by myself again. And we'll uh, take a look at books 21 through 24. 24 is my favorite book, favorite chapter, favorite section of the Iliad. And I'm eager to talk about it with you. Okay, see you next time. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.